Hello students and welcome back to my channel Bonding with Chemistry. I'm Dr. Seema Singh and in today's video I will define acids and bases according to Arhina's theory and help you identify the common characteristic of all acids and bases. To begin with, let us find out what exactly is common to all acids. For this, let us write the names of few commonly known acids. We've already come across all of these in my previous videos on this chapter. In case you missed that out, you can always find it by clicking at the links provided in the description box below. So, we have hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, the king of chemicals, nitric acid, methanoic acid, also known as formic acid present in red ants, oxalic acids in tomatoes, acetic acid in vinegar, and carbonic acid in your soft drinks. We see that all these acids have a common suffix acid. This suggests that they belong to one category or one family and we call that family as the acid family. Now let us look at the chemical formula of these acids and spot the similarity. We see that the element H that is hydrogen is common in all of these. This is your oxalic acid, your carbonic acid, this is your formic acid and this is your acetic acid. Thus, we can generalize that all acids have suffix acid in their names and at least one or more hydrogen atom, here you can say one and here you have two, in their chemical formulae. Dear students, kindly note that in your higher classes, you will learn various other concepts which would state that there are substances which do not contain hydrogen, yet are classified as acids. But for your class 10 level, this generalization holds true and you need to just focus on the statement. Now, also by looking at this formula, I can say all these acids have H as the common cation. You all know cations are positively charged ions, whereas anions are the negatively charged ions. So here you may have chloride ion, here you have sulfate ion and since Cl will be carrying a minus charge. We have chloride anion, sulfate anion, nitrate anion, oxalate anion, carbonate and here we have acetate. So all of them have common cation hydrogen whereas the combination of anion is different. The next step is how do we exactly define an acid? There are several concepts or theories given by various chemists that define acids and bases. I would take up one of these theories in this video. You would be studying about the remaining theories in your higher classes. So, let us take up the Arrhenius theory or the Arrhenius concept for defining acids. The Nobel laureate Swante August Arrhenius was a physicist as well as a very renowned chemist. In the year 1884, he proposed the Arrhenius theory which defined acids and bases. According to this theory, acids are substances that dissociate in water. The word water or aqueous is very very important when you define acid according to Arrhenius concept. And they dissociate in water to give hydrogen ions which are also known as protons and are represented as H with a positive sign as superscript. So you will have H positive for hydrogen ion or proton. Can I also say that an arrhenius acid is going to increase the concentration of hydrogen ion? Obviously, when arrhenius acids are going to produce hydrogen ions in water, they definitely will increase the concentration of H plus ion. For example, HCl in presence of water, either you use the word AQ that is aqueous or on the arrow you write water. HCl is an arrhenius acid because in presence of water, it dissociates to give a proton and an anion chloride. So since it gives a proton, it is an arrhenius acid. Let us take up another example, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is an acid equal to arrhenius because in presence of water, it dissociates to give rise to proton. Here you will have two proton because you have two hydrogen atom and you have an anion which is known as sulfate anion. Dear students, this hydrogen ion or proton is quite reactive and unstable and thus it cannot exist all alone. It actually exists as 
hydronium ion which is formed when H positive that is proton combines with the surrounding water molecule according to the following equation. You have proton here, it combines with water molecules and you have H3O positive. In actual practice, both H positive and H3O positive are used interchangeably by chemists. For instance, if we look at the dissociation of HCl, we see that the first method, this is the first method, it is quite shorter and easier because you are nowhere showing hydronium ion. You are showing the dissociation of HCl as H positive and Cl negative. But the second method, although time consuming, is an accurate method of depicting arrhenous acid that is HCl. HCl will dissolve in water to give rise to hydronium ion plus Cl minus. But in general, either description is acceptable for showing the dissociation of an arrhenous acid. Mostly the students prefer the first one, that is this. Even if you write the second one, it is correct. Just as we did in case of acid, let us now find out what is common to all bases and then define them according to arrhenous theory. If we look at the names of some common bases that we have come across earlier, we see that the suffix hydroxide is common to all the bases. Thus, all these substances belong to one common category or class known as the bases. Looking at their chemical formula, we see that the group of atoms OH, here you can see here, one shown in black, the group of atom OH is common to all of them. Here OH is an anion with a negative charge, one negative charge and is known as hydroxide. Thus, we can generalize that all bases have the suffix hydroxide and at least one or more hydroxide groups in their formulae. Here you can see there are two, but here there are one. As I mentioned earlier, students, note that you would be learning exceptions to this generalization in your higher classes, but for your current level, this holds true. We also observe here that the anion is common. You can see hydroxide, but the combination of corresponding cation is different. Here you have sodium ion, here you have potassium ion, here calcium cation. Remember, it was vice versa in acid. Now, similar to acids, Arrhenius also defined bases. He proposed that bases are substances which dissociate in water. Again, the word water is important as far as Arrhenius acids and bases are concerned. And they are going to give hydroxide ions represented as OH negative. Can I also say that since they are going to give OH minus ion in water, they will increase the concentration of hydroxide ion. For example, we have sodium hydroxide. In presence of water, it is going to furnish any positive cation. And since it is furnishing or producing OH negative ion, it is classified as Arrhenius base. Similarly, you have example of potassium hydroxide. Now, not all bases are soluble in water. A base that dissolves in water is given a special name called as alkali. For example, your sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, they are bases that dissolve in water and hence they are also called as alkali. After knowing what are alkali, can I say that all alkalis are bases but all bases are not alkalis? Give the statement a thought. By now we know what is common to all acids and what is common to all bases. So let us find out which is that characteristic that is common to both acids and bases. The answer is that both acids and bases have tendency to conduct electric current but in their aqueous state or when dissolved in water. Let us understand how. Now in order to conduct electric current we require Carriers of charge. You must have already studied this in your physics class and would also learn more about them in higher classes. Let me explain you briefly. Now these charged species or carriers of charge can be ions or electrons. You all know that ions can be positively charged known as cations or negatively charged called as anions. In my previous slides, I defined that acids release H positive ions and bases release OH negative ions when dissolved in water. 
So, since they produce ions which are charge carriers, acids and bases have a common tendency to conduct electric current and this becomes their common feature. Let us perform an activity to investigate that acids and alkalis conduct electricity when dissolved in water. For this, we take a rubber cork and fix two iron nails on it. We are going to then place this cork in a beaker and connect the nails to the terminal of a 6 volt battery through a bulb and a switch. Thereafter, we will slowly and carefully pour some dilute hydrochloric acid into the beaker. Now, when we will switch on the current, you can see here, the bulb glows. We are going to repeat the same activity with dilute sulfuric acid, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide solution. In all these activities, we will observe that on turning on the switch, the bulb glows. Thus, the activity illustrates that electric current is passed through all these solutions of acids and bases. And the current is carried by the movement of hydrogen ion and the corresponding anion in case of acids and hydroxide ion and the corresponding cation in case of bases. Let us recall the chemical formulae of some common acids. Now can I say that all of them contain hydrogen atom and when dissolved in water they will release proton or the hydrogen ions or hydronium ions which will carry electric current and thus make this compound acidic in nature. Does that mean that all compounds containing hydrogen atom are acidic in their aqueous form? For example, glucose. I am sure you must be familiar with its chemical formula which is C6H12O6. It contains hydrogen atom and it is soluble in water. So will its aqueous solution be acidic? Similarly, ethanol or also known as ethyl alcohol whose formula is C2H5OH. It is one of the members of alcohol family. We are going to study about them in carbon and its compound later. Now, it also has hydrogen atoms. Fine. And it is miscible or soluble in water. Will it also conduct electricity and thus show acidic character? Let us find out the answer to these questions with the help of the previously explained activity. We will repeat this activity with aqua solution of glucose and alcohol one by one. On performing the activities, we find that the bulb does not glow with any of these solutions, whereas it did glow in case of dilute HCl and dilute sulfuric acid. Thus, the activity suggests that glucose and ethanol solutions do not conduct electric current. The reason being that, unlike the acid solutions, both glucose and alcohol did not produce hydrogen ions when dissolved in water and in the absence of ions which are charge carriers the electric current could not be carried and hence the bulb did not glow. So it is not necessary that all compounds containing hydrogen are acidic in nature. I am sure now you would be able to answer this NCRT question. Dear children, in both these activities that I have mentioned I told you that it is very important that the acids or bases are dissolved in water in order to conduct electricity. What exactly is the role of water? And what will happen if we do not dissolve an acid or a base in water? I mean, what if we take an acid or a base in its dry state or anhydrous state or dissolve it in a solvent other than water? To figure this out, let us perform another activity. For this, we will take a small amount of sodium chloride, your common salt and NaCl, in a clean and dry test tube or a boiling tube. We are going to fix a delivery tube through a rubber cork at the mouth of the test tube as shown in this figure. We will remove the cork slowly and carefully add some concentrated sulfuric acid from the walls of the test tube and close the cork. We are going to heat the test tube with the help of Bunsen burner as shown in the figure. We are going to observe that a gas with a pungent smell comes out or escapes through the delivery tube. Even without heating, you should be able to observe the gas fumes. The gas is hydrogen chloride 
and it is produced according to this equation which says that solid sodium chloride in presence of concentrated sulfuric acid is going to give you hydrogen chloride gas and sodium hydrogen sulfate. Now we are going to test the SCL gas vapors first with the dry litmus paper and thereafter with the wet or moist blue litmus paper. When we bring dry blue litmus paper, we observe that the color of the paper remain unchanged or intact. Whereas in case of wet or moist blue litmus paper, the color changes to red. This activity shows that in absence of moisture or water, the dry hydrogen chloride gas does not release hydrogen ion and thus doesn't show acidic character. It doesn't convert blue litmus paper red. Whereas in presence of water that is moisture, the acidic character is exhibited. Why so? Because in presence of water, hydrogen ion is released which converts your blue litmus paper into red color. So from this activity, can I conclude that acids are going to show acidic behavior only in presence of water that is in the aqueous solution? The same holds true for bases. Simply the presence of H atom or OH group will not make a substance an acid or a base. The release of H plus ions and OH minus ion which happens in presence of water is going to make them an acid or a base. So what exactly is the role of water? Water helps in separating ions from an acid as well as base. For example, in case of acid, let us say HCl, when it is going to be dissolved in water, this water is going to help in separating the ions. Which ions? The hydronium ion, H3O positive, as well as the anion Cl minus. And thus, the importance of water. Uh, dear students, just a small note. In case you are carrying out this activity in humid conditions such as rainy season, you are supposed to pass this liberated SCL through a guard tube or a drying tube. Now guard tube is simply a glass tube which has a bulb in the center filled with a desiccant. And generally the desiccant is calcium chloride or it could be silica gel. This is your desiccant. The role of the desiccant is to keep away the moisture from the gas. That means to keep the gas dry. Because in case this SCL will catch moisture from the atmosphere, then it is going to turn your dry litmus paper red. And hence we will not be able to perform the activity in a proper manner. To put to test whatever we have learnt in this video, let us take up few important reasoning questions which could be put up in your board examination. I am sure after going through the various activities in this video, you are in a position to answer the first three questions. I would suggest you to pause the video and try writing the answers in your rough notebook. It shouldn't take you more than five minutes to answer all of them. In case you need help, you can go through the answers that I have provided. Now coming on to the last question which says that, why does distilled water not conduct electricity whereas rainwater does? Your distilled water or pure water does not dissociate into H positive and OH negative ions. In absence of ions which are charge carriers, it does not conduct electricity. Whereas rainwater contains acidic impurities. Where do these acidic impurities come from? You have carbon dioxide in the air, sulfur dioxide also. In combination with water, they give carbonic acid and sulfurous acid. Now these acids in presence of water are going to liberate ions and thus your rainwater is going to conduct electricity. With this question, I come to an end of this video. In my next video, I'll take up a very important topic, the pH scale and how it is used to determine the strength of acids and bases. So if you have yet not subscribed to my channel, make sure you do it now. Also, if you like my video, do give it a thumbs up. And for latest update on my videos, hit the bell icon. Thanks for watching and stay bonded, my dear learners.